Hi everyone, Sleepy Soul here, and in today's video, we're going to cover another sector in the endless quest to find the best bargains in the uh, tax loss selling season that happens in early December every year. And this this video is going to be on the banking sector. So we're going to start the video with Bank of America. Uh, we'll we'll touch base with our, one of my my favorite. Uh, trading vehicles Schwab and then uh, and then we'll, we'll see what else is worthwhile looking at in the sector during tax loss harvest season uh, for those of you that this is their first video they're watching in this sec in this series the idea with these videos is we're uh, tax loss harvesting season is a uh, is always the really the first week after Thanksgiving till mid-December uh, and it's when a lot of funds uh, that use uh, the calendar year are forced to sell uh, losers uh, based on Either things in their uh, in their uh, ADV or other uh, other or just kind of they want to realize the losses, and they and that creates buying opportunities because it removes a lot of the marginal sellers from these securities, uh, allowing them to kind of explode to the upside in in early Q1 Q2 of the next year. Uh, so this one this video is going to be on the banks, and as I mentioned, we're going to start with Bank of America. So Bank of America has just been beaten to heck in a handbasket since Silicon Valley blew up. I mean, it opened the year this year at about thirty four dollars and change, uh, th right around here. Uh, it kind of spiked up to thirty seven dollars, uh, and then was just been on this massive, massive, massive uh, pull down in March. It fell all the way to twenty five dollars before finding some rebound and it's been trading relatively tightly in this range of about 26 to about $30 a share. Uh, it currently trades, uh, after market on Friday at uh, $29 and 72 cents. Um, but if you notice on the volume profile, there was this massive selling, this almost at least this liquidation level selling in, uh, March into early April. And that really hasn't been bought, uh, matched by some of the buying yet. So uh, that's something that is one of the the negatives on this stock is just be careful that it you know it really does need that massive green uh, green buy day to to really benefit the uh, uh, to, to offset some of the selling and push the price higher. Now that being said, uh, their last earnings call, which was uh, what day was it? Thursday, October nineteenth. No, excuse me. Thursday, October nineteenth, and uh, they um, uh, they reported okay earnings. Uh, the thing that everyone's focused on is their held to maturity basket. Uh, I drew this line um, last time I did or talked about Bank of America, which was six uh, six weeks ago. Uh, but their held to maturity basket actually increased, which was surprising in October uh, when they reported it. it was one hundred thirty one billion dollars. Now they did make some commentary. Uh, they did have some commentary on uh, their basket. Uh, notably, they had this this back and forth between Alistair Broderick, uh, which who's the uh, C CFO, and uh, Jim Mitchell, who's a analyst with C uh, Seaport Global. Uh, they, he mentioned he was at, uh, he asked a question uh, specifically about NII uh, and why the market uh, why they might be mis the market might be pretty mispricing the stock uh, because Bank of America thinks now again remember this is October 19th before the latest Fed meeting. Uh, they think that the Fed is done, and sure enough, the Fed indicated that at the most recent conference call, and hello, the stock price has been kind of on a roar ever since because, you know, one, management seems to know what they're talking about, uh, and two, uh, you know, that benefits uh, Bank of America. We'll get to the second point in a second about why pausing gets the benefits Bank of America. But Alistair's main point was around this being an earnings problem. Yes, they have $131 billion of unrealized losses uh, in there held to maturity book. That is a factual statement as of the end of Q3. What people aren't realizing is that they have no interest in uh, in realizing that. In fact, at a conference call uh, or, or conference, Brian Moyne, right before this, con uh, right before uh, this conference call, uh, uh, Brian Moynihan said, uh, what was the exact quote? We, we don't expect any losses on our health to maturity securities, Moyan had said in a conference uh, in New York on Monday. This is an article from Bloomberg entitled Bank of America's Moynihan said no losses on health to maturity securities, which was published right before this conference or right before their earnings on the 19th. Uh, we have a lot of experience managing these types of portfolio and we're confident in our ability to navigate through that environment. So that's some back background on uh, Broderick's comments. Uh, so if you assume that Moynihan's correct, that they're not going to take any losses on the health to maturity securities. Now it's that create that means it moves from a 
uh, solvency problem or a bankruptcy problem that Bank of America might be going bankrupt to a earnings problem, which is the actual issue right now because it's going to have a drag on earnings because those are out, are uh, real, realistically the security they own are under going to underperforming cash until they mature, and that's built in. And I think for the most part, that has been realized in the stock price. The stock is flat over the last nine months. Uh, it's going to likely be flat into the new year. Uh, but we'll talk about where I think it goes in a little bit, because obviously I wouldn't be talking about this stock if I thought it was just going to be flat for the next year. So Alistair mentions that there's going to be two. There's some there's some confidence around NII trothing. NII stands for net interest income, which is how much money they make on de- the money people put deposit in their account. And they think it's going to growing in the back half of the next year is it because the, he thinks that we've seen the last of the fed hike or the last of the fed hike is a month or two from now uh, and at some point deposit pricing is going to stop going up and there'll be a natural lag to that that's pretty normal and then what you'll see if you look forward into the fur, further future future forward curve is we actually got fed cuts three of them in the forward curves from next year and then he goes and talks about how there's there's uh they have operating leverage and they have deposits all over the world and there is some lag and that's going to affect them so it's not going to really appear in the earnings until probably q1 or q2 of next year but that's notable because the market's going to if the moment the market thinks that the fed is really done and i don't mean like kind of indicating that there's still technically a chance they, they raise rates and they're, I think, January meeting the market's currently pricing like 20% chance. If the market backs that out of the Fed curve, Bank of America will outperform. And I'll explain why in a second, but I want to talk about these Fed cuts real quick. So the, the market is also currently pricing in three Fed cuts. The reason the market is pricing in three Fed cuts is because the market's really pricing in roughly a 30% chance of there being like a 2% cut. Currently, the Fed futures rates are about five, five and a quarter. Uh, the market's basically saying like, no, we don't, the market's saying, oh, we think the rates are going to go to four and a half by next year. But what the, the market's not really saying that, the market's really saying, hey, we think there's a possibility the Fed cuts to 3% or even 2%. And we think that probability is 80 or, or 60 to, or, or 30 to 35%. Ergo, we have to price in three Fed cuts because we want to make sure we're, back, we're we're pricing in 30% of a 2% uh, of a 2% cut. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, that's kind of why you're seeing three cuts in the in the Fed curve for the future. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, but then, uh, so that's the that's the question on NII. The next question from Erica Nigerian from UBS, who's one of the best bank analysts on the sell side, uh, she tries to ask a question about cash flow you forecast for your health maturity book in 2024. And Alistair says, I'll take the first part. It's sort of averaging 10 billion a quarter. So again, they're at 131 billion of unrealized losses. Uh, and they're estimating 10 billion of cash flow a quarter. So they're estimating approximately that this should get paid down to somewhere around 90 billion by the end of the year, which is 5% of the overall uh, share price because that'll affect book value. So the book value will go up, which means the market capitalization will go up because the, the banks trade on price to book. Uh, and the market capitalization is currently, let's call it 235 uh, flat. So roughly 40 billion, uh, 40 into into 240 is is one sixth. Uh, so uh, you know you're gonna you could potentially see uh, a, uh, what is it one one uh, what is one sixth uh, of a hundred if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 16% growth if that if they do get that 10%. I'm sorry guys, I, it's been it was a long Thanksgiving weekend for me. So they should get that 16% growth, uh, you know, into the stock price. So that would put them, if you assume the 10%, again, where do they report earnings here? What was their price? Uh, let's call it 28. So let's do this plus one times 28. So that gets you to $33 and 20 and 66 cents, which, you know, realistically, let's put that, let's say they get there in March, uh, right about here that's pro- uh where's my pen uh right about here oh, hit the wrong button february march 3266 right about here that's probably where the 200 week's going to meet them um historically buying on the below the 200 week on bank of america has been profitable if you hold it for more than a year and a half i think it's been the been the thing so if you buy today you're going to make money uh, and i think it actually outperforms the market on a two-year basis if you include dividends which is a three you're getting a three percent dividend for bank of america which is uh slightly above their historic average um but yeah so that's probably your short-term target uh is is about another 10 percent upside from here uh and you get another 
a little less than a percent. So you're getting 11% return in about three months. It's not fantastic. What makes Bank of America interesting, though, is, again, those comments that uh, Moynihan said he has no interest in, they, they have no plans on realizing any losses. Well, if you pay attention, I know this is kind of dry stuff, though everyone seems to have an opinion about it now. If you pay attention to the yield curve on the two-year, uh, the three-year, uh, and the five-year, and I mean, you can even go out to the 10-year, it as these rates go down, so remember, on, when they basically reported on, on the 19th, the five-year was at its uh, recent high. I mean, you have to go back. I mean, they don't even have a chart for, let's see, all. Uh, the last time the five-year was this high was 06. Um so, you know, if you look at if you look at uh, the five year yield, every per, uh, tick down is increasing the value of their held to maturity securities, which means they can start either realizing those assets or as cash flow flows off of those, uh, they can pay those down and then realize them without taking a mass taking a loss or massive loss or, or uh, a, a, any law or a massive loss or potentially any loss at all. And again, you see all these curves have kind of started peaking around the same time. That's basically when the Fed uh, basically said they might not be raising interest rates. But again, you notice the two-year isn't going down as fast because the rate cuts are, are being priced more and more the further out you go because there's more and more of a recession chance. Because So like the five years at 4.5, the, the three years at 4.67, and the two years at 5%. Um, so if you have assets that are in that two to three year period of maturity cycles and, uh, and that you're underwater, you need this number to keep going down. Uh, you would like a two year, you don't really care what the two year is if the three year goes to 1%, because if your assets are all three years plus, uh, which a lot of Bank of America is on the longer end, they went very long duration, five years plus. So they really need this five year to fall below, like 3% would be great for them. Every percent, every tick down this takes, Bank of America will see support in their stock price, period. So if you are the believer that they are going to, uh, there is going to be a recession, you should short a bunch of stuff, but you should be long uh, um, something like bank, you should be long something like Bank of America because Bank of America will outperform the market in that scenario because they are basically a basket of 10 years right now. So if you look at the 10 year, which is a, what TNX, I think is the symbol uh, to trade. If you look at the 10 year, and again, the, this yield curve is falling down. Uh, it, it basically peaked at 5%. There's a potential. It goes back up well into next year. Uh, we're talking you know, if it follows the 1970s, it won't, it'll, it'll kind of crest down at the 4.3 right around March or April and then shoot higher. Um, but every tick down this thing does every tick down, you know, as it, as it ticks from, you know, it's, if it doesn't go like this, you know, up, if it goes down like this, this is all very bullish, basically any bank besides JP Morgan, uh, because JP Morgan is very, uh, very low, um, short duration. They, they have a lot of short duration stuff. They, they don't have anything really outside of uh, the next two years. So really, if you don't, now that could change every quarter, but as of right now, they don't just don't have a lot of long-term exposure. So if you think this is what the 10 year is going to do, you should just buy Bank of America. You will outperform trying to long bonds, basically buying a, a mutual fund. Now, there is a little more risk to owning the banks. Um, I'm not going to deny that, but the, the dividend yield uh, usually helps offset that uh, because it will um, – uh, it will uh, get, that that yield gets raised in theory every year. Uh, bear with me one second. Let me just clean up this chart, uh, and then we'll get to the next stock. Okay, so that's on the longer end. If you want to go short, you look at Schwab. Now, where is the Schwab earnings numbers? Here it is. Uh, okay, so this is Schwab's appendix from their most recent earnings call. Again, it was back in uh, what day is this? Monday the 16th. Uh, so they reported the same week as Bank of America. It might have been the day before. Uh, they had this appendix as of September 30th. Again, this is their fixed maturities that are their uh, held, to, held to maturity assets. If you notice, as I mentioned with the, the charts on the three-year, uh, how it's going down, their big exposure is three, four, and five years. They have a little bit of one-year exposure, a little bit of floating, which this is that floating doesn't really hurt them. Uh, a little bit of one-year exposure that they are getting some rev some net revenue from, but their their losses are all coming on that three and four-year paper because the net rate is 
negative uh, the care by, based uh, after you put factor in carry costs. So really, they need they would like the three year to report have the same air uh, same rate as they're showing here because it'll increase their value. They'll make a ton of money. And they'll look beautiful. But if if you think the three year is going to be flat or the four year or the five year is going to be flex again, there's no four year. So you're buying a five year paper that is now yielding a yield at four years. Uh, if you think that's going to be flat, uh, maybe Schwab's not a great investment. But again, if you think yields have peaked, Schwab is going to outperform the market. OK. That, that just it will. Uh, the other banks will too. Again, the Schwab Bank will. And again, this is a, it's it's a very. I mean, again, you take the take the volume profile here, and there's a lot of red that really hasn't been realized with enough green to justify it. That being said, it has been on a little uptrend though. That uptrend just broke. Um, when I did my past video on Schwab, and I've done I think three or four videos at this point on Schwab, uh, I did mention that $55 mark seems to be kind of the pivot point to them. It's it's it really you know you got to go back to the uh, 2018 for what it was chopping around there before they uh, uh, merged with uh, or bought TD Ameritrade, uh, and then obviously the stock price did amazing. But yeah, it's been in an, the the, cha the the channel seems to be uh, 55 to 67, which is where uh, where the resistance and, and support lines were before. Again, it got up there uh, back in July. It would not surprise me for me for you to see that uh, again early next year. Uh, again, a little more than a little less than two percent dividends, a one dollar. You're not don't expect dividend raises from Schwab, not until they really until 2025 is probably the next one going to hit. They might do one in 2024 if rates really collapse. But again, it, you know. If you think Schwab's a little more interesting because they do they have the stock market arm, so if the market's in the news, people people invest in Schwab or trade in Schwab, which means they're they're going to make some money on options trading, et cetera, et cetera. And I know there's probably a bunch of people on FinTwit who've, who've literally paid uh, their whole salary into Schwab just on uh, just on options premiums uh, or for for con for trade contracts. So again, Schwab is not a stock you look at and go, man. This is this is a really great stock right now. I think it's probably going to be a better buy longer term, sometime early or mid next year, if it's down at the fifty-five dollar mark. Because again, you know, this three year now becomes two and a half years. Uh, which so if you buy it this time, if you buy it this time next year, it'll be this will all be in the two year. You know, the market's going to start pricing this that this is going to be off their book uh, by tw in twenty twenty five because it's less than it's less than eighteen months out. Uh, so they'll start getting ahead of that. It'll make future earnings uh, numbers start rising. You'll start seeing, uh, you know, num uh, multiples of, hey, this is trading out 10 or 11 times uh, 2025, 2026, 2027's earnings, maybe even less than that. I think there's uh, some early analyst numbers have said they, they've seen, you know, close to $6 a share in earnings in 2026. Obviously, we're not even in, we're about to hit 2024, so we're still three years out from that. But again, you're buying something at theoretically less than 10 times earnings then with a little bit of a dividend, uh, and it has shown support below the $55 level. It's bounced off sub 50 both times, all three times it's gotten there. I just don't know if it's going to go up as aggressively. Again, this is more of a midterm, a three, two, and five year play. Uh, uh, it, that's what Schwab is compared to Bank of America. Uh, the last bank I want to talk about, and again, I want to be clear, like you can run through the list, like KeyBank. This is another one that's got a lot of crap on its books uh, in terms of long duration. If you think, uh, if, again, if you think the deposit levels are safe-ish, like it probably breaks through this $20-$12 chop and kind of heads up maybe to $15. It's above the 200-week that's been, uh, or 200 day that's been straight down. Heck, it might go back to the 200-week. This was a historically one of the um, uh, more soft-spoken regionals. Uh, you know, uh, we can go through the list. Uh, uh, Truist is garbage. I, just garbage, garbage, garbage. Uh, I, I owned it at one point and listened to a couple of earnings calls, and I thought because they they're they're the SunTrust old old uh, uh, old SunTrust Bank uh, down in the south. So I was like, oh, the Southern Regionals will probably do better because their real estate exposure, their, their commercial real estate exposure will be better. Nope, not true at all. Uh, it's been worse a worse performer than KeyBank. Um, again, you can run through the list. Fifth, third, what is it? Uh, fifth, third, Bank Corp. Uh, uh, what is it? Fifth, 
There it is, FTIB. Uh, you know, again, similar looking chart, just collapse above the 200 week. Uh, you know, again, th that uh, same story. It's a regional, it's weak. If you think deposits are fine, you can go long regionals. You can make the list of literally pick your basket of regionals. You can just do KRE, which is, again, the similar chart to all of these. And if you think rates are done and you think deposit outflows aren't going to be terrible, commercial real estate is not enough of a negative exposure to not be long uh, some sort of upside in banks. Uh, I don't think I don't think you should whole hog your account into into banks, uh, but again, I think they will outperform if you if rates start falling. In in a recession like they will very much outperform because what will happen is if the if if there is a recession a a recession outside the United States and any banks that don't own paper outside the United States will do great. So that you'll see JCPM underperform and something like Bank of America, which owns more domestic paper, outperform because Bank of America ha or JPM and Citi have a lot of external United States exposure. Okay. One last bank I want to talk about real quick, uh, Discover. Uh, as I've men I mentioned, I had a video of Discover. Uh, it'll be linked below. Uh, here was a earning their earnings call uh, for Q2. They announced they had some uh, the, the they had some alphabet in, uh, agencies you know, the FDIC, uh, uh, DOJ, I think was looking into them, uh, and Department of Education as well. We're all at some inquiries about some of their business practices. They thought they were a little off. Uh, that caused the stock price to fall here. Uh, then they announced that their CEO was going to resign and their stock price fell to here. Uh, sub $90 has always been a good spot for them. That's been true for, uh, since their high, their pre COVID high in August of 19. Uh, that's how you pull that. Uh, they're trading at, I mean, out of the low end, eight times earnings, uh, $10, $10 for 2024 is, is kind of what the low end of expectations are for them. Um, if you get, if they show any type of growth, because remember they do have some student loans on their book, there's a high likelihood if that gets paid either by the government or just by people and they don't have to write that money off, uh, that's probably going to be accretive to their share price. Uh, you could probably see a push back to the 95 to $99 range, which is uh, almost 20% upside from here. So this one's more of a special situation because of the CEO related issues. They haven't done buybacks. Bank of America has always been a big buyback stock uh, for years and years and years. I mean, it was just aggressively pay, uh, buying back stock. Uh, but I think there's a real possibility. You could see them maybe not in March. Let's move it out here a little bit. Uh, you know, probably in June or July, they get to the 105 and retouch this downtrend line that they've been on since their COVID high. Uh, so, that's that's bank uh, that's Discover uh, and Bank of America and Schwab and some regionals. Uh, I think the whole banking sector is very interesting because again, if you think rates are falling are going to fall because of a recession, they they provide upside. Uh, if you think rates are falling because we we've how somehow hit immaculate disinflation uh, and they're going to stop relatively close to where they are now, that's the only scenario where banks aren't going to perform to the upside uh, because it'll evolve because that'll evolve just a slow bleed of employees as companies continue cutting to maintain their operating margins. So banks are in a very unique spot here. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of downside is built into the price already. Uh, limited upside is built into the price. Uh, if it, there's there's some, it, it's kind of a very interesting macro thought. Um, uh, and then I, I really think it's either going to be them or energy that are going to be the best performing sector uh, or energy slash materials. Let's just call it commodities are going to be the best performing sector in uh, 2025 or 2024. But that'll be energy will be for another video. Anyways, uh, that, that my name is Sleepy Soul. If you like this content, please click the like, subscribe, like and subscribe button down below. Uh, my next video will be on the the. Uh, recently mentioned energy sec or energy stocks that I think we should buy during tax loss harvest season. I hope you all have a great, uh, you had a great long weekend and I hope you're all making money. Talk to you all soon. This is Sleepy Soul. Have a great rest of your day. Peace.